Hello, my name is Jim Tarver, and I am the medical director of the Advanced Lung Disease Program here at Advent Health Orlando. Today, we're going to kick off a series about pulmonary hypertension, which we're calling under pressure. And I hope that over the course of this series, you'll understand why we call it under pressure and how that relates to the disease process. I'm honored today to be in the company of two of my colleagues here who you will get to know better as we go on with this series as well. To my immediate left is Dr. Stacey Mandras, who is a transplant cardiologist as well as a pulmonary hypertension expert, who is also the medical director of our pulmonary hypertension program. And to my far left is Dr. Jason Stansberry, who is a pulmonologist and also a pulmonary hypertension expert. And we're going to just chat a little bit about pulmonary hypertension, so welcome. Hi, Jim. Hello. So let me start with you, Stacy. Um, so we're talking about a disease called pulmonary hypertension, and you're a cardiologist. Explain to me why a cardiologist would actually be involved in this disease process. So that's a very good question, Jim. And if you look around the world, I would say about half of the specialists who take care of patients with pulmonary hypertension are cardiologists and the other half are pulmonologists or lung doctors. And it's very hard to say that one is more appropriate when treating pulmonary hypertension than the other because you cannot really separate the two. The right side of the heart receives blood from the body and sends it off to the lungs where a person will pick up oxygen, which then gets delivered to the left side of the heart, which pumps that blood that's full of oxygen to all of the tissues. We use oxygen to make energy. It's the fuel that we run on. And so when the blood is empty of oxygen, it returns to the right side of the heart, pumps the blood back to the lungs, and the cycle goes on and on. The reason pulmonary hypertension or high blood pressure in the lung matters is because the right side of the heart usually pushes against a very low pressure system. And so if the pressure in the lungs goes up for any reason, the right heart can become bigger, it becomes weaker, and ultimately it fails. And it's this right-sided heart failure that can lead to death. And so for that reason, it makes sense that a cardiologist might be the one taking care of patients with high blood pressure in the lungs because of the effect that it has on the heart itself. Thank you. So we're really talking about what sounds like then a heart disease. So why then do we have a pulmonologist involved as well? Jason, do you wanna sort of bring this around and, and explain to us, number one, why we call it pulmonary hypertension, and mm -hmm. number two, what involvement pulmonologists may have in terms of adding to the understanding of this disease? Oh, well, there's a very tight interplay between the heart and the lungs um, that's involved. Uh, so the reason why a pulmonologist would also be involved in this is that there's many times uh, due to respiratory diseases, there's going to be effect on the vasculature within the lung to cause it to actually constrict. Um, so many times we will see some degree of pulmonary hypertension as a natural uh, course of the disease in processes such as COPD, interstitial lung disease, or such as COVID-19 as we are seeing currently. So basically what we're saying is that there's an interplay between the lungs and the heart um, and that many different disease processes actually contribute to um, causing pulmonary hypertension. So Stacy, can you just tell us about the different types of pulmonary hypertension and kind of why it's so important for us to understand that? So the World Health Organization has classified five different types of pulmonary hypertension into groups. And all of the disease processes that fall into these five groups are similar in the underlying etiology or cause of the pulmonary hypertension and ultimately the way that they present in patients, the symptoms, the physical exam findings, histologic findings, and the treatment recommendations. World Health Organization Group 1 pulmonary hypertension is what we truly classify as pulmonary arterial hypertension or what people think of as pulmonary hypertension. These are disease processes such as inherited pulmonary arterial hypertension, patients who have pulmonary arterial hypertension in the setting of connective tissue disease, HIV, um, adults who have congenital heart disease with corrected shunts, portopulmonary hypertension, Chagas, or not Chagas disease, schistosomiasis. Mm -hmm. Um, and 
if you look at all of the patients who have WHO group one pulmonary hypertension, they all behave similarly and they respond similarly to treatment. WHO group two is probably the one that I see the most and I would say most pulmonary hypertension experts see the most and that is high blood pressure in the lungs in the setting of left-sided heart disease. So people who have systolic or diastolic heart failure, valvular heart disease. What's important to know is that these are patients who really do not respond well to management with the pulmonary hypertension medicines that we use in WHO group one. In clinical studies, they really haven't been shown to help and they can in fact make things worse. And so it's really important to differentiate between WHO group one pulmonary arterial hypertension and WHO group two pulmonary hypertension. We do that by performing a right heart catheterization where we measure the pressure in the lungs, we measure the filling pressures on the right and the left side of the heart. And ultimately, if we find that the filling pressures are increased on the left side of the heart, that that's a patient who has WHO group two pulmonary hypertension and that patient really should be treated with their heart failure medications, having their valve disease addressed, et cetera. WHO group three, are patients who have pulmonary hypertension in the setting of underlying lung disease. And these are patients who probably land more in the pulmonologist's office before they wind up in our office. But like Dr. Stansberry mentioned, these are patients who have high blood pressure in the lungs with an underlying lung condition like COPD or pulmonary fibrosis. WHO group four is actually a very interesting type of pulmonary hypertension. And that is patients who have high blood pressure in the lungs in the setting of having long-standing blood clots or chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension. It's a specific interest of ours here at Advent Health because we actually have a program made up of experts who have a specific interest in treating CTEF. Mm -hmm. The important thing to know about patients who have CTEF is that there is a surgery that can significantly impact and perhaps even save patients who have CTEF. And anyone who is a candidate for that surgery should undergo surgery rather than being treated with medical therapy. The last group, who group five, are patients who have either multifactorial or unknown etiologies resulting in pulmonary hypertension. And just like who groups three and four and five and two, these patients really do not benefit with treatment with pulmonary vasodilator therapy, but rather the underlying illness needs to be addressed. Okay. So one of the things that you mentioned is treatment, and particularly medications to treat pulmonary hypertension. And so tr traditionally, our medications have been primarily addressed towards who group one pulmonary hypertension, in some rare cases, who group four pulmonary hypertension, but we actually have been fortunate enough to participate in a number of research studies, and recently the INCREASE trial released data looking at a potential new option to treat patients with who group three pulmonary hypertension. So Jason, do you wanna to talk to us a little bit about the role of treatment in uh, who group three pulmonary hypertension? Because this is something that is um, really exciting for us, I think. Definitely. Um, so WHO group three pulmonary hypertension is pulmonary hypertension due to lung disease. Uh, so this is primarily driven by hypoxic vasoconstriction. So low levels of oxygen within the lung uh, can actually cause the pulmonary arteries to constrict. Uh, within this population of patients, which you can imagine it's any type of lung disease that can cause a low oxygen saturation, there is a portion that have it due to fibrotic lung disease uh, that have actually been demonstrated in a recent trial um, to have benefit uh, with the usage of an inhaled vasodilator. So the benefit of this therapy is the medication is inhaled and is delivered to the regions which are being used in gas exchange and it can also open up the arteries in those regions so then your lung can work more efficiently. Uh, so this is, this is a uh, uh, very exciting time because now we can offer a, a new treatment uh, to this population of patients and help um, alleviate some of their, their dyspnea. You also have an interest in pulmonary hypertension associated with connective tissue diseases. And I think this is sort of a nice segue because some of those connective tissue diseases are also associated with interstitial lung disease. Can you so can you talk a little bit more about connective tissue disease in pulmonary hypertension? Definitely. 
Um, so the population of patients with, with systemic sclerosis, they're, they're at risk of having um, pulmonary hypertension due to the disease affecting the pulmonary arteries themselves, but also they can be at risk for having pulmonary hypertension if they develop a fibrotic lung disease. Um, so this population of patients, uh, they're, they're at rather increased risk for both of these disease processes. Um, so they should really be actively screened. And when we can identify patients with these disease processes, we can make sure that they get put on the right therapy early in the disease process. Therefore, it benefits them in the long term by having uh, improved outcomes. Um, so we can get these patients on the right therapy at the right time early in the disease process, and then we can control their disease, improve their symptoms, and get them back to a more normal life. That is very exciting. So Stacy, you are the medical director of the Pulmonary Hypertension Program. And I, I think it would benefit our listeners to understand the role of having a program to treat this disease process. And maybe you could also talk a little bit about the accreditation process and what that means in terms of services that can be offered to patients with pulmonary hypertension. So Jim, it really takes a village to take care of a single patient with pulmonary hypertension. Within our program, we offer a lot of different services for our patients. Within our very own clinic, we have the capability to do echocardiograms with a specific focus on the right side of the heart and on pulmonary hypertension. We do our own six minute walks in our office. We do lung function testing in our office. We have very highly trained individuals who work with us, nurse practitioners, nurses, medical assistants who know what it takes to get these very specialized medicines that have to go through an extensive prior authorization process available for our patients. Our patients come from all over and we offer for them opportunities that may not be available to them locally. Research is a big part of our program, being, off, being able to offer to patients new treatment options that are not yet approved by the FDA, but might really help change their disease course and how they feel. The Pulmonary Hypertension Association has created a system in which they are able to evaluate programs to make sure that all of the standards which they feel are necessary to deliver comprehensive care to patients with pulmonary hypertension are being upheld. It was a rigorous process to go through getting our program accredited, and it's probably something that you and the entire program should be most proud of. Um, having gone through the process myself, I know how much work it was, and I think that patients who have pulmonary hypertension and providers who are caring with patients, caring for patients who they think have pulmonary hypertension, really needs to seek out who their closest pulmonary hypertension accredited centers are to ensure that their patients are treated appropriately and so that they get the best possible care. All right. Well, thank you. I do think it's really important and very exciting that we actually have been able to achieve the highest level of accreditation through the Pulmonary Hypertension Association um, and the fact that we're one of only four accredited pH centers in the state of Florida. Ultimately, that's really about providing the best care available for these patients with pulmonary hypertension in conjunction with their referring physicians. And I think that's a really important point for us to emphasize that we're a supplement to, um, not a substitution for the relationships that our patients have developed with their referring providers. And I think that's really very, very important. Um, I'm excited to have kicked off this inaugural series of um, talks about pulmonary hypertension under pressure. And I hope in the future that we can actually spend some time talking more about each of the different groups and the importance of how we work this up um, and the multidisciplinary nature that is needed to take care of this really complicated um, group of patients. Um, in closing, do you guys have any other final remarks or thoughts? Jim, I'd just like to point out that if you notice, I'm wearing purple today. Uh, yes. And so mm -hmm. November is Pulmonary Hypertension Awareness Month, and purple is the color, periwinkle, is the color of pulmonary hypertension. And I think the more people that learn what pulmonary hypertension is, 
both patients and physicians who have an index of suspicion for it, the earlier people recognize it, the earlier people get diagnosed and the earlier people get treated. And I think that really is the key to improving long-term outcomes. Well, thanks for actually pointing that out. That's very, very important as well. And hopefully through the rest of the month, as well as through the rest of the year, we're going to bring uh, back information about pulmonary hypertension. Thank you for joining us for this first episode of Under Pressure. <laughs>